So I'm glad to have uh, Steve Irwin here to do our book in this week. Steve got his bachelor's degree from Harvard University and PhD from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, and then went to the Naval Research Laboratory as a postdoc, went away briefly to do another postdoc at UPenn, and then came back and has been a staff scientist at NRL since 1994, so a little while. Uh, seems to be a place that holds on to people. And has been the, the head of the materials physics and technology branch since much more recently, since last year. And where he's been a you know, computational material scientist um, doing the sort of things that many other computational material scientists do, working on energy, uh, sorry, electronic and structural properties of materials but also some things that are a little more different. Um, from my point of view, an interesting one of looking at nanocrystal growth and structure and dynamics, uh, bringing a little bit of computational rigor to a field that hasn't had a whole lot of it. I think that's what it's been told. <coughs> well, thank you, Matt. Um. So I haven't known Matt very long. He did come to uh, MNR, NRL a few months ago to give a very, very nice uh, seminar to us. And it turned out we discovered we have some very common and or broadly overlapping interests. Um, but I hope to give a talk today that touches not just Matt's interests, but also interests that many of you might have too. It's kind of a mix of chemistry, chemistry and physics. Um, I gave this talk last week to a chemistry department, and I've given it also to physics groups, and I think there is something for both. Um, so as Matt said, I'm from, from a theoretical group at Naval Research Lab, but all the ideas that I get and things that I work on come from experimentalists. And in this particular case, the experimentalists are uh, these two guys, Florian Ott and David Norris. So I've known David for about uh, 10 years or longer or so when he was a professor at the University of Minnesota and one of really the world's best nanocrystal growers. Um, not just a grower, but he does you know, physics as well. Um, and he called me up, I don't know, about four or five years ago and said, I have a really, really motivated student named Florian. Uh, he's going to get his master's degree pretty soon, in like nine months or so. And he wants to do it in theoretical in a theoretical field, but my group is all experimental. So can you be his advisor? And I thought that was really a horrible idea. Um, for one thing, you know, they live in Switzerland and I live in Washington. And long distance relationships, well, sometimes they work, but it just seemed really, really hard. Well, the end of the story is that Florian was an extremely motivated student and did this beautifully. Um, so he got his master's degree nine months later. He won the ETH medal for the best master's dissertation. And then he stayed on with David to be a PhD student and has since then done some really wonderful work. Uh, two of the projects that I'm going to describe are projects that he and I did, um, most of it long distance in fact. He did eventually come to Washington and I went to Zurich a few times, but it was mostly done long distance. So that taught me an important lesson that these kinds of relationships can work if done properly. So the two projects are actually kind of unrelated to each other. I've put them under a single umbrella here. They're both related to how nanocrystals grow. One sort of from the perspective of the inside and the other from the perspective of the outside. Um, so the first uh, project is the first project I did with Florin, in fact, and that's on something called cation exchange, which is a really well-known phenomenon in the chemistry world, but maybe not so much in physics. So let me just tell you the, a little bit about the experiment that motivated all of this work. It's not that old. It was about 10 years ago that the group of Paul Olivasados um, at Berkeley did a very beautiful experiment uh, using this phenomenon of cation exchange, which has been known for at least 100 years, uh, but this time in nanocrystals. And so here's the, how the experiment works. You start with a population of nanocrystals that you've already created. So these are CAD selenide nanocrystals. That's the, by far the dominant material, systems, ma material system that nanocrystal growers work with. Um, and here they just so show X-ray diffraction confirms that this has the wurtzite crystal structure and it, the usual fluorescence and absorption spectra that you expect for cadmium selenide nanoplate, but, uh, sorry, nanocrystals. Then you expose this ensemble of nanocrystals to a little additional, uh, to, to some silver in, the, in a solution. And what happens is that the silver presumably goes into the nanocrystals and expels all of the cadmium. So that's the cation exchange part. 
And after the exchange process completes, what they do is, is see that the crystal structure has changed. So it's gone from hexagonal to orthorhombic, a crystal structure called nominite, which I'd never heard of. And the optical property is completely different. And these are all of the crystal and crystallographic properties and, for, and optical properties of this material, this new material, silver 2 selenide. So this is actually a very interesting way to make a new material from an existing material. If you know how to grow one type of nanocrystal, you can sometimes, or at least in certain circumstances, make another type of nanocrystal where you don't know what the synthetic recipe might be just by doing this cation exchange reaction. And of course, a relevant question is how long does this take to happen? And the answer is for nanocrystals, very fast, order milliseconds or so. Even more interesting, I find, is that you can do this reversibly. So if you now offer the system a little bit of excess cadmium, the reverse reaction occurs. All the cadmium drives the silver out and you return back to cadmium selenide nanocrystals, which have their proper hexagonal crystal structure and the usual optical properties. So that's all pretty interesting. Um, and I want to focus on this first thing, or one of the things I mentioned, which is that this process is extremely fast in nanocrystals. So you might say, well, okay, but nanocrystals are extremely small, so of course it's extremely fast. Well, if you just do a back of the envelope calculation and look at the rates of cation exchange in this exact material system for bulk crystals and then just scale it down to nanocrystals, you find that that doesn't work out. You don't get the, these very fast rates. You get fast rates, but nowhere near this fast, milliseconds. So something about nanocrystals is even faster than you would expect from size scaling. Second point to keep in mind is that this exchange reaction is fully reversible. Uh, third thing to keep in mind that I didn't mention actually is that the anion sublattice, so the selenium sublattice, uh, at least in this case, is in a, sort of an inert uh, particip non-participant here, so it's preserved. That's a, process, uh, that's a quality called topotaxy. And you have this interesting you know, transformation of the crystal structure from wurzite to this weird nominite crystal structure. And so a natural question to ask as someone who does computational material science is what is the microscopic mechanism that makes all of this possible and how do we ex understand these four points? How can, we make a, can we make a model that explains all of these four points? So the way we would address this in uh, computational physics is to look microscopically, you know, atomistically, at what might happen. So let's start with the host material, cadmium selenide and the wurzite crystal structure, and ask where silver would go into this lattice. And so we find two obvious places. One is as a so-called interstitial impurity atom, sitting here, you know, not on a lattice site, but in between host ions. And the other possibility is on a lattice site, where we take the place of the cadmium site. So that's a silver impurity, a substitutional impurity on the cadmium site, the pink atoms or cadmium. Okay, so now let's try to understand how these two uh, impurity sites might behave electronically. We look over at the periodic table. So this is a 2,6 material. So cadmium is in column two and selenium is in column six. So just without any further thought, we might say, well, if silver substitutes for cadmium, it's got one too few electrons to provide the bonding that needs to be made. And so it will take an electron from somewhere, from the Fermi C, if you like. And so that's the pro those are the properties of an electrical acceptor. So we would expect silver on the substitutional site to be a, an acceptor. On the other hand, if we have silver in an interstitial site, well, it has no bonding requirements, so it simply comes with its single S electron. It's in column one, remember. And so it would possibly give up that electron to the, to the lattice and therefore would be a donor. So this is all just my you know, plausibility argument. One really needs to look into these things. And so one way to look into this is computationally, again, by doing a calculation. So here I've used density functional theory, which is a sort of a quantum chemistry method designed for solids, to calculate the so-called charge transition levels. That's how you identify the electrical activity of impurities in a host. And without going into the details here, let me just say that for the silver interstitial, um, the, what this shows here is that the material that is that this impurity really is a donor. It likes to give up its electron, and silver substitutional really is an acceptor. It likes to take an extra electron. And so what that means, and the only thing you really need to take away from this, this slide, is that these two sites, these two types of impurities have opposite charge. So silver interstitials are generally charge plus one, 
and silver substitution are generally charged minus one. And that's going to be the key to understanding all those four points that I mentioned on the first slide. Okay, so how can we understand those points? So we have to go into a little bit more detail now and ask how these two different impurities might interact with one another if they were both present in the lattice at the same time. And so of course one obvious thing that oppositely charged um, atoms, ions would do is to attract each other electrostatically. So you might expect that, suppose I had a substitutional impurity here in its minus one charge state. Well, then probably if there were an interstitial impurity somewhere, it would be electrostatically attracted by the Coulomb force, okay? And you can verify this as well by doing another calculation. And without going into the details again, this, um, sp this spectrum of um, charge transition levels indeed verifies that exact picture. You can also investigate this another way, energetically, by you know, doing a computational experiment where you put the interstitial atom at different locations and then calculate the energy of the system and then plot the energy on the vertical axis against the distance between the plus and minus charges. And you see that they fall on this curve 1 over r scaled by epsilon, which would be the dielectric constant of the material. And so all of that hangs together very nicely. So we really do see that there's a Coulomb attraction between these oppositely charged ions, just as we expect. Okay, now I want to think about how uh, atoms, how these ions move in this system. So let's think about the simplest case first, this interstitial silver ion moving through the lattice. So it would move through kind of a channel here where it never interferes with any of the host atoms. That might be, a, you know, not a simple pathway, a rocky road if you like. One can again investigate that computationally and find out what the so-called potential energy surface is for that diffusion. And it turns out not to be a very rocky road. There's an activation energy that's required to make this traversal, but it's a small energy on the scale of the available thermal energy. So the, mo the largest energy you ever have to pay is just 0.2 electron volts, and that's, that's a small number on the scale of um, thermal energies. And you can even work out the hopping rate at the temperature where these experiments are carried out, which is room temperature. So all you have to do is take this Arrhenius expression, so that's the exponential of the energy barrier divided by kT, that gives you the, um, a certain factor less than one. Multiply it out front by an attempt frequency, which is a number that's generically on the order of 10 to the 12th times per second. And what you get is an approximate or an estimate of the hopping rate at room temperature. So what this says is that at a rate of 100 million times per second, this interstitial ion hops from this site to the next site and then to the next site. So each of those is a separate reaction, and it will do 100 million of those in one second. So that's obviously very fast hopping. So what we say, bottom line, is that interstitial silver diffuses very easily at room temperature. Very easily meaning very quickly. Okay, so that should all be clear. Now let's complicate the picture a little bit and ask what would happen if we had not just the pure host and a single atom or single ion diffusing inside of it, but uh, one of these substitutional silver ions nearby. And suppose we started to diffuse in the direction, as we know will generally happen, of that oppositely charged ion. So without even doing a calculation, I can write down what the potential energy surface would look like because I know all the things that contribute. So it's that sinus sinusoidal picture I just showed you superimposed on top of the one over R Coulomb attraction. And so what I get it overall is this gray curve. And it's very simple, it's just a mathematical consequence that what happens is then that this barrier 0.2 eV actually becomes progressively lower as I get closer to the oppositely charged particle. That's just math. So at least in this case, it's not a very dramatic effect. You know, we've gone from 0.2 eV to 0 0.18, 0 0.16, 0 0.13. So you can say that these diffusion barriers are reduced in the vicinity of a nearby substitutional silver impurity. Okay, that's not a dramatic effect, but now I want to show you a very dramatic effect. And that's for the other reaction I need to consider to understand um, cation exchange. And that is the actual exchange reaction itself. So how does a silver that's floating around here in these interstitial sites actually ever get on to a substitutional site in the first place? So suppose they all enter the nanocrystal, we're thinking now, as initially interstitial silver, but eventually they must get converted to substitutional silver. So how does that happen? So the simplest way that might happen is by this so-called kick-out reaction. 
the atom comes close, kicks out a cadmium atom, which now itself occupies an interstitial position. Okay, so that might happen. I can calculate the energy barrier for that to happen, and that turns out to be rather large energy on the scale of thermal energy, so about 0.7 electron volts for that chemical reaction that I just showed you. And again, you can use that Arrhenius expression to work out how often this is going to happen. And doing the same kind of calculation I did before, you get a much, much, much smaller number now, 10 times per second. So that still sounds fast, but if you think about it, a nanocrystal has maybe a few thousand atoms in it, and so this reaction has to happen a few thousand times, 10 times per second. That doesn't really work out to the whole thing happening in one millisecond. There's just a mismatch there. So this is not quite the whole picture. Okay, so let's make the picture a little bit more complete. And one thing we have to take into account now is, okay, when we did that kickout reaction, the silver went from being interstitial to being substitutional. But I already told you that substitutional impurities have the opposite charge state. So let's make the opposite charge state here. Cadmium itself is now no longer in the lattice. It's now an impurity in the interstitial. It has its own charge state, which is plus two because cadmium is divalent. It easily gives up its two electrons and becomes plus two. So those charge states were properly put into the calculation I just showed you of the potential energy barrier. But now let's again suppose that there's a nearby uh, spectator substitutional, if you like, that's already there in the lattice when all of this happens nearby. So now the, dip, the, the big difference is that I have kind of this favorable arrangement of alternating plus and minus charges here. So minus one, plus two, minus one. The whole thing is elect electrically neutral, but it's always good to have opposite charges in this alternating fashion. That's what a basic salt is. Sodium chloride is alternating plus and minus charges. And so now let me redo that potential energy calculation in the presence of this spectator impurity atom with the opposite charge state. And what I find is a very dramatic thing. The, the barrier for that reaction is now dramatically reduced from 0.7 to 0.4 eV. And if I again work out the rate, um, I find this now happens 100,000 times per second. So that begins to get suggestive that maybe this is what's happening, this kind of um, reduction of the barrier because of already present substitutional silver in the vicinity. Okay, it's at least a plausibility argument. You have to grant me that. So now I've looked at those two reactions, the only two that I really need to look at for this whole picture, the kickout reaction that I've just talked about and the diffusion reaction that I showed you before where atoms just wander through the lattice. Now I have enough to actually try to understand the whole cation exchange reaction in a nanocrystal. And so this is what I would like to do in principle is to take a nanocrystal, let's make it a cubic nanocrystal just for simplicity. That's not really the shape of nanocrystals, but that's not going to be very important. It is a small thing though, it's so a typical nanocrystal might be five nanometers in diameter or so. Question? Sorry, I lost perspective. Okay. What do you want this crystal to do? Yeah. What, what are you looking for? How do you, this crystal is supposed to function as, as what? Um, do you mean what's the point of all of this yeah. in, the, in the real world? Yes. Okay, so uh, two points. One is something that I mentioned but maybe glossed over, and that is cation exchange could and probably is a useful way to make new nanocrystalline materials when you don't have a, the time or energy or knowledge to work out a synthetic recipe. So the, the recipes for making nanocrystals from material XY are sometimes not clear from the get-go, and the details matter. But if you can make a nanocrystal, like cadmium selenide, which anybody can make, then if you can make a new material by just putting it into a solution of silver or mercury or barium or whatever, and relying on cation exchange to do the work for you, then the job is done. So you're just, at this point, you're just saying, hey, look, we can make these, these new things. We don't, we don't know what they're good for, but we're just going to... Explore. Oh, well, now you're asking a broader question. What are nanocrystals good for, I guess? <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, no, I'm just trying to figure out, like, where are you going with all that? I'm not, okay. not my ear. Well, right. let me give you also the second answer to the question. So making new materials is one thing. But another thing that I didn't mention at all is, suppose you could um, stop this cation exchange process midway through, or just partway through. So call that arrested cation exchange. That might be a way to make doped nanocrystals. So, cad selenide nanocrystal with seven silver atoms 
in it, in it somewhere. So that constitutes doping in the language of nanocrystals. And just as in the world of semiconductors, doped materials are technologically more useful than pure materials, although it's good to be able to make both at will. So doping is a, is a big part of the reason for doing this and trying to understand this. Okay, so what I would like to do then as a, as a computational person is to make, you know, on the computer, make a little nanocrystal and then put in a couple of silver atoms, silver ions, and then watch them diffuse and see what happens, see if I get cation exchange. Now, I need to supply more silver to get complete cation exchange, and I imagine that that, you know, I would imagine silver coming in from the solution from the outside, so diffusing in through some surface pathway, that might be the right way to do this. And I might want to do this with molecular dynamics, maybe ab initio molecular dynamics, where I really calculate all of the forces um, at every time step and integrate the, the equations of motion and really follow the random diffusion of, and then occasional kickout reactions. But again, a little bit of thinking makes it very clear that ab initio MD is not going to get you anywhere in this problem for the following reason that in order to integrate the equations of motion accurately, just Newton's equations, you need to take a very, very small time step. And the typical time step for ab initio MD is really small, one femtosecond. So you have to do a simulation where every femtosecond you update the positions and forces using quantum mechanics, density functional theory or something, and then do it again. So we already know how often, approximately how often a kickout reaction occurs. Remember I, I told you that. And if you take ratios, what you find is that you would need to execute very many molecular dynamics time steps before you even simulated a single kickout event, something on the order of, what is this, 10 million time steps. So that is not an inexpensive calculation, um, even for this really small system, and that just gets you one kickout event. We really need you know, a few hundred kickout events to understand cation exchange or complete cation exchange. So that's simply not going to be feasible. So I'm going to use a very different method, a method that is, um, um, in a sense, a cheat, um, except that it's not. Um, so it's the method called the Kinetic Monte Carlo method, and it's a very interesting method for simulating exactly this kind of system here, where you want to evolve a system from one state to another, a well-defined state to another well-defined state, which, and then the evolution occurs according to some processes, a list of finite processes, finite list of processes. So what you do in KMC is to make a list of all of those processes. So you really need to know what they are in advance. And if your list is incomplete, if you've left out something important, like something I haven't thought about, then that will never happen in your simulation. And that's one thing that you give up with doing KMC. Ab initio MD would presumably show you all of those unanticipated things, but KMC only shows you anticipated things happening. So then you go through each of the processes in this list. There are only two in our list, diffusion and kickout, and compute the energy barrier for each of them. I've already shown you those energy barriers. It's 0.2 EV for diffusion. It's 0.7 EV for kickout, but it also depends on whether there are atoms nearby, ions nearby. Those reduce the barriers. So I take all of those reductions into account as well. And then I do a stochastic simulation where I allow all my processes to occur stochastically by rolling the dice. Hang on one sec. But I arrange for things to happen, for all my processes to occur with the proper relative frequencies given by that Arrhenius factor. What's your question? So you said you had two relevant processes, right? One is diffusion and one is kickoff. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the silver atom, it's sitting on the hollow side. Can it diffuse in towards the uh, oh, from, from the outside, for example? From outside the inside. Yeah, so that's a very interesting question. Um, so the outside of the nanocrystal, for those of you that don't work on nanocrystal, is not what I show you here, which this is what would be called a bare nanocrystal. Real nanocrystals are passivated on the surface by some kind of organic molecules normally, or maybe inorganic short molecules or even atoms, but some kind of organic, some kind of passivating species. So I, I don't want to get into the weeds of how exactly the silver gets in. I just know that it does get in, and it starts outside because that's how the experiments are carried out. So what I'm going to do in the simulation is simply put them inside at some random location intermittently. 
Okay, I'll occasionally add silver to the system somewhere in the, in the interior and not worry about the details of how exactly it gets inside because we know it does get inside and I don't really care so much about the answer to that question. Yeah? This is undergoing thermal vibrations. In reality, yes. And does that make a difference with how they're trapping? Um, uh, I don't think it would make a difference to the things I'm going to show you today, but I can't make a blanket statement that it wouldn't. So, of course, lattices expand at finite temperature. They also vibrate um, rather a lot at room temperature, which is where these experiments are carried out. So those could all be interesting effects, but I think they're probably second order compared to what I'll be showing you. Okay? Okay, so just to continue with what KMC is and why use it. So the bottom line why, why use it is this, in blue here, is that the, you get the accuracy of ab initio MD as long as your list of relevant processes hasn't omitted anything important, but the actual computational speed is many, many orders of magnitude better than ab initio MD. And when I say many, I mean like six or eight or ten orders of magnitude more efficient. Okay? And that's essentially because I don't waste a lot of time simulating the vibrations of the system as, it, as particles vibrate around the troughs of their potential energy wells. I don't really care about that so much. I, don't, I really only care about particles getting over the activation barrier and moving on to the, do the next thing, whether it's diffusing or kicking out. So in KMC, I just do that and then advance the system clock appropriately. Okay, so that's going to be my approach. I'm also going to make some what seem like drastic simul uh, simplifications, which I should come back and check later, and I will. One is that I'm going to do my entire simulation on a two-dimensional crystal that has square symmetry. So that's obviously not the real system. The real system is three-dimensional, and it has wurzite, hexagonal symmetry. But maybe those details don't matter so much. Um, remember I told you about topotaxy, the selenium atoms don't matter, they don't participate in this reaction, so I'm not even going to show you them, they're gonna, certainly not going to do anything. So here I'm just showing you the cadmium sublattice, which I'm taking to be square. And now I'm going to show you the simulation, or I'm going to get to it. Um, I'm going to start the simulation with just two silver ions located at some random position in the, in the lattice. And I'm going to carry everything out at room temperature because that's how the experiments are done. I'm, as I mentioned, I'm going to add silver atoms continuously and I'll always show them as these light gray circles, okay, as interstitial silver. I'm not going to even show you the cadmium atoms unless they're actually being kicked out and then I'll briefly show them to you as they're being kicked out because otherwise it's just too visually distracting. So let's just leave this light gray grid. You can understand that cadmium atoms are at all the grid points here. But whenever that kick out occurs, remember the important thing that I said uh, to keep in mind is that silver atoms then change their sign, the sign of their charge. And so I'm going to change their color just to remind you about that sign change. I'm going to change them from light gray to dark gray whenever they occupy a cadmium site. And the most important thing of all is that I have to calculate the Coulomb interactions between everything, all the particles, Okay, here it's just two, but when I have a lot, that's going to be, you know, n times n minus one over two calculations. So that actually gets to be the biggest computational expense in this problem. By the time you get about 100 silver ions in, it gets to be rather annoying and the whole thing slows down. But you'll see the result by that time, no problem. Okay, so let's let things go. So at first you get these just random diffusion events, which aren't very interesting. But if the first thing that happens is going to happen right here where this silver ion kicks off a cadmium ion, but then it kicks right back because the barrier for the reverse reaction is very small, and so the net was nothing. So things diffuse around a little bit more. I'm going to speed up the movie a little bit. Now something else is going to happen up here in the left-hand corner. I've added more silver, as you can see. I'm going to get another kick-out reaction right here. Uh, watch for it. Um, so here it comes. And now cadmium is on the surface of the nanocrystal where it presumably can go out into solution so it doesn't kick back. So now I have one of these kickout reactions that was successful and I change the sign of that particle. That makes one of these bound pairs, electrostatically bound pairs. And the presence of these 
oppositely charged particles now changes the whole potential energy surface in the vicinity of this region and more of these kick out reactions now are catalyzed in that reaction. So there's kind of a positive feedback mechanism that the more kick out reactions that occur up here the more can occur because the barrier is continually being reduced. Not indefinitely, but it's reduced enough so that this process happens quite often now. And as you'll notice, of course, this happens not just in the upper left-hand corner, but uh, elsewhere along the periphery of the nanocrystal. And that's indeed where experimentally this reaction always gets initiated, at the outside of the nanocrystal, and then it propagates inward. And so what you're seeing here is the first stage where things get going. And by the time I've stopped the simulation here because it's getting annoyingly slow, what you see is, if you look, an alternating pattern of dark and light gray circles. So that's an alternating pattern of plus and minus charges, which of course is stable because electrostatics makes that stable just like a, a salt does. And that's what I see all around the periphery here is this alternating pattern of plus and minus charges. Okay, so just to summarize, that reaction started at the surface, or at the corner, by kicking out a cadmium atom, just one cadmium atom, which went into solution. That created a substitutional silver impurity, which had an opposite sign, and so attracted interstitial silver impurities and formed these paired, so formed one paired complex. That warped the potential energy surface in the vicinity of that pair and promoted the formation of additional silver two pairs near the first one. But now there's a question you might reasonably ask me, and that is, well, is the stuff that I've made here with this alternating pattern of plus and minus charges, is that really what they make in the experiment? Silver two selenide with nominite crystal structure? I haven't told you what nominite crystal structure is, so it's a good question. Well, let me show you at least, a, I can't really give you a definitive answer, but I can give you a plausibility argument. So here I show two pictures of two different crystal structures. The one on the left is the one we've just been talking about. That's wurzite cadmium selenide, now completely substituted with silver. So I've actually removed all the cadmium, and in place of every cadmium atom, those were pink, remember, I've put two silver atoms, one dark gray, one light gray. That's what the simulation told us to do. And those form a, a crystalline structure of their own. It's not wurzite anymore, but it's, of course, related to wurzite because that was the starting material. And in blue here is sort of a conventional periodic unit cell, if you like. Over on the right is a completely different thing. That's nominite crystal structure. I had to go look this up in a database of crystal structures because I'd never heard of it before. But it has the same stoichiometry as the material on the left. It has two silver atoms for every selenium atom. And actually, the two silver atoms occupy two different crystallographic sites. So they call them silver one and silver two. And so I've co colored them suggestively dark gray and light gray. And now I want to show you that these, although they look like very different crystal structures, are almost the same. So here's the one on the left, and in a moment it's going to deform to the one on the right. That's the entire deformation to go from the left to the right. And now I just go back and forth a little bit to show you that that's a very minor deformation. It's just a little bit of a rearrangement of the internal crystal structure. If you just focus within you know, the, the blue rectangle, you, you see there's very little motion required. Okay, so that's plausible then that if you make this thing on the left, it would transform to the thing on the right. And then the next question should be, well, is it energetically favorable to do so? Well, the answer is yes. So here I have the energy calculated of those two, two crystal structures. Well, zero corresponds to the structure on the left and one corresponds to the structure on the right. So this is a generalized chemical reaction according to that reaction coordinate. And if I start with the two crystal structures I show you, this idealized um, substituted wurzite, that's energetically downhill all the way with no barrier. That's a little bit unfair because I really have to, in a calculation, relax all my structures. So let's relax my initial structure and my final structure. And then I find that there's a very small activation barrier, but it's still energetically downhill. That small energy barrier, 0.1 EV per formula unit, that can be overcome or surmounted with the available thermal energy. So I think that's about as far as I want to go with you know, that plausibility argument. So fully doped wurzite cad selenide is almost the same as nominite silver 2 selenide. 
We can return to the simulation and ask now, I've been telling you that these Coulomb reactions are vital, and so I can do another computational experiment where I actually screen out the Coulomb interaction. So I make the dielectric constant of this material very, very large. I could do that easily enough, and then ask what happens to the calculation. So the simulation, I just jump to the end here, looks like this now. I've stuffed in dozens of silver ions. Almost all of them remain as interstitial. Only three or four kickout reactions have occurred. So that's really not compatible with experiment. And what that shows you is that these Coulomb interactions are actually essential for cation exchange. And finally, uh, I can come back to my horrible approximations where I made a, this three-dimensional Wurzite nanocrystal into a two-dimensional square system. Yeah? Why is the Coulomb process critical? Why? Um, because they give this positive feedback mechanism. So as soon as you get the first reaction, remember I showed you that reaction that occurred in the upper left here? That gives the chance of further reactions occurring in the vicinity by lowering the activation barrier for those reactions in that immediate vicinity. So it's the Coulomb interaction that makes that possible. And you can see that by this experiment where I zero out the Coulomb interaction and then it doesn't happen. That's the only thing I've changed here. Okay, so let me return to my gross approximations and see what happens if I do everything right now. So this is a three-dimensional nanocrystal with the Wurzite crystal structure. This is my first silver atom here now that's colored red. Um, this is a histogram of where it spends most of its time, so it's mostly in the middle. Now I add two, they repel each other, and so the, they sort of spend more time uh, avoiding each other. And as I add more, uh, silver atoms, that repulsion becomes even greater. They spend more and more time on the periphery of the nanocrystal. And now I speed up the movie a little bit, and eventually I get one of those kickout reactions occurring at the surface. And there, I, now I've changed the color from red to blue, and that catalyzes additional reactions in the vicinity of that same reaction, and you get, again, this uh, uh, alternating pattern of now blue and red atoms, so plus and minus charges, just like I showed you in the two-dimensional case. And now you can see almost all the silver is clustered around the periphery of the nanocrystal, just as they find experimentally. And so this eventually will propagate inwards, um, but it always initiates on the exterior. Okay. So that's the end of the first half of this talk. If you have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer. Yeah. So I think the critical parameter is the B, right? So how do you determine the I showed you that epsilon, the dielectric constant. I simply take it from the calculations themselves. So what that really corresponds to is calculating the dielectric constant of cadmium selenide, which is a known parameter. It can be measured experimentally. I, I don't know the number offhand. It's of order 10, I suppose. Um, but you can do it computationally as well, and that's what we did. It doesn't really matter. I guess overall the precise value would change the time scale for the whole reaction. Um, but this time scale, I mean, this reaction occurs with using that value of 10. Um, you can see the time up here. So this is on the order of, um, uh, what is it, 100 milliseconds or so. So microseconds, sorry. So not even a millisecond. So this reaction goes fairly far towards completion about a quarter of the way in the first, uh, before the first millisecond has elapsed. So that's actually quite compatible with, see what, with what's seen experimentally. Okay, so now I want to move to the second half of the talk. Yeah? Well, the lattice is, is, is regular, then it's being bonded, does it need to be needled or I don't believe so. Uh, it's always possible that I've you know, glossed over that part of the paper when, when I read, because many things are lightly annealed, but I, I'm not aware of annealing as being a critical step for these cation exchange experiments. Right, so, right. so the, whole, the whole story, as, yeah, as you've just said, is the Coulomb interaction when confined to a very small volume, and so the distances between particles is very small of order you know, one or two nanometers or, or less, and the screening is very weak because these are semiconductors, not metals, so those forces are enormous. Okay, okay so now I come to a different physical system. Um, what, I, what are called uh, nanoplatelets, although they go by other names, I don't want to get involved 
into, the, or into a history of the naming, I like this name of nanoplatelet. Uh, and this is my, an artist, well, my conception of what a nanoplatelet looks like. So it's an atomically thin nanocrystal, um, which is very wide in the other two dimensions. And so that's what you're seeing here. This is um, just like four atomic layers in thickness and a few tens of nanometers in width and length, I guess you would say. So these materials were first discovered rather recently in 2011 by a group in Paris. And the first picture here doesn't really give you the full impact of what a nanoplate looks like. I've got a much nicer picture in just a minute, but I'd like to show this just for historical reasons because this was the first. So this is a TEM image of, again, the same material, cadmium selenide, but when grown under somewhat different, slightly different uh, thermodynamic conditions, actually just lower temperature for the most part, um, they, instead of forming quantum dots, as I showed you before, they now form these very anisotropic structures. Here they're viewed mostly um, in plan view, so you're seeing them from the top. Uh, I'll show you a better picture in just a second. So as I said, their thickness is just a few atomic layers. Uh, their length and width is a few tens of nanometers. And <clears throat> what's interest of interest for today's talk is that X-ray diffraction shows that they have the cubic crystal structure. So remember, I've just showed you the first half of the talk was about the same material, cad selenide, but it had the hexagonal crystal structure. So it's an interesting fact that for cadmium selenide, these two crystal structures are very competitive with each other. And if you change the details of the physical conformation, one or the other might be the more stable form. So it happens to be the case that the cubic stru crystal structure is stable for these nanoplatelets. What's interesting, while well, there are many things that are interesting about platelets and why uh, many people are, for instance, Matt Pelton is investigating them, uh, but just to give you the bottom line from my point of view, is that they're spectrally very, very pure material. So they have very sharp spectra, photo, this is photoluminous spectra, and they're very well separated uh, as you tune the thickness of the platelet from, say, six monolayers down to three monolayers, you get spectra that are separated really very nicely from each other. It's possible to chemically separate these, uh, not even to separate them, but to grow them very pure so that you get an entire population of essentially, say, all five monolayer platelets. Um, so that's not even particularly difficult, uh, as I understand. Okay, so here's the better picture I promised you. This is a single nanoplatelet now. We're again looking head on. And so you can see that it's pretty square, right? Uh, the lattice spacing here is just to confirm that this really is cadmium selenide in the zinc blend, that is to say cubic crystal structure. And again, separate x-ray diffraction experiment confirms that. So again, the shape here is a very thin square. And now something that I didn't mention before, and that is that the facet, the crystallographic facet that you're looking at from the top here is the 001 facet. And on the bottom, of course, is the 001 facet. But because this is a cubic system, on the sides, the very thin sides, there are four of them here, it's also 001 facet. So that's a kind of a nice thing. It makes this a very simple system. All the exposed facets have the same crystallographic orientation. But now this raises a very puzzling question, or at least it was extremely puzzling for me and maybe for other people as well. Why does a material that has a perfectly isotropic crystal structure, cubic, form this extremely anisotropic shape? Why does that happen? So this problem plagued some other people too, and there were many suggestions in the early literature uh, to explain it. And so these are a couple of the explanations. I don't want to get involved in them. In the end, we found good theoretical and experimental reasons to reject all of them. And instead, we proposed our own explanation, and that's what I want to talk to you about now. So here's our explanation, or at least this is the, um, what you need to understand our explanation is a very simple idea from classical nucleation theory. I didn't invent nu nucleation theory. This goes back at least 150 years or so. So the idea is the following. Suppose you want to um, compute the energy to form a droplet, a spherical droplet of some new material, this green material. So you write down the energy as a function of the size of the droplet. And so there are two terms in this case. So a term for the volume that you've, this volume of material you've made, and that involves the, you know, the, sphere, the geometrical volume and multiplied by the energy per unit volume of whatever material that is compared to whatever it was previously, say, in solution or dissociated as atoms or whatever. 
But you've also made some surface, and so you have to add a surface term. So that's the area of the surface multiplied by the energy per unit area of the surface. So whenever you have a surface in contact with some other material, it could be vacuum or liquid or whatever, there's a surface energy term. And so both of those contribute. Okay, so that's all I need now. And I add those together and I get this black curve. And as you can see, the black curve is for small sizes, totally dominated by the surface energy contribution. But at large sizes, eventually the volume term wins. And so if you can pay the price of getting over this activation energy again, so this is a certain energy that can be computed exactly for this case of the spherical droplet. If you can get over that, if you have that energy on hand, then forming this droplet is exothermic. It will grow and grow and grow, okay? Because presumably the new phase, the green phase, is more stable uh, than whatever the alternative phase is. And for that reason, I put a minus sign. And that's why this volume term goes down. Okay, so that's classical nucleation theory. It's been around a long time. Maybe you studied it in a textbook, or maybe not. I didn't. Now let's apply it to, nano to, to nanoplatelets. So uh, the algebra is a little different here, but the basic idea is exactly the same. So let's suppose that I have a nanoplatelet that is partially grown, and I want to ask, what is the energy required to grow another layer on top of an already existing facet? Let's tar start with the wide facet, you know, that broad um, 10 nanometer by 10 nanometer, let's say, facet. And I suppose I nucleate an island in the corner. That's always the simplest place to nucleate an island. And then it propagates across the entire surface. And I ask, what is the energy required to do that as a function of the size of the island? So let's take the size of the island to be A. That's the area of the island. I'll make it a square island just to keep things simple. And I'm not going to go through this algebra here. You have to trust me that it's correct, um, but it's basically the same thinking as before. There's a volume term because I've made new volume, so this island has a certain volume, which is the height of the step times the area of the island, and I multiply by the energy per unit volume. So that's my green term, just like I had a green term in the previous slide. I've also made some new area. That's the blue areas here, so those didn't exist before, so I have to pay the price to making new area. So this is the geometrical area. It's all wrapped up in here, multiplied by the energy per unit area. And I also make some new edges now. So this is a new feature that wasn't in the spherical droplet because droplets don't have edges. But there's a, a red term now, which accounts for the uh, length of these edges uh, multiplied by the energy per unit length of the edges, OK? So that might not be the correct way to actually calculate the energy when you consider this is really, you know, an atomic structure. Um, it's not an, you know, a, just a, um, it's not jellium, but this would be a good first starting point. Okay, so in the next step, what I do is to use an accurate method that is material specific, again, density functional theory, to calculate the three parameters that appear in this energy expression. So the energy per unit length, the energy per unit area, and the energy per unit volume, those are all things that be, can be calculated with DFT, and that's what I've done here. So these are just numbers. Given those numbers, now I can draw the curve for the energy as a function of the size of the island. And again, qualitatively, it has the same shape as the nucleation theory picture that I showed you before. So it starts small, at large sizes it's exothermic, and it has a maximum somewhere. Okay. So the maximum in this case, what we're interested in about the maximum is the energy that it corresponds to. So about 1.2 electron volts. So that's about the price you have to pay in order to nucleate an island. Once you pay that price, then it will keep growing and reduce its energy as it gets larger and larger. But you do have to get over the 1.2 EV barrier. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, this is exothermic, so how does the surface volume ratio this heat has to leave this thing, right? This heat has to leave this structure. So this is, this, is, this, is, this is all internal energy at zero temperature, in fact. Okay? So this is, this is internal energy that you gain by, say, transforming the material that I'm making this island out of from some other phase. It could be you know, dissociated atoms or a different crystalline phase that has a higher energy. And I transform it into this phase, which has a lower energy. And that difference is this term right here. You said it was exothermic. Right. So this is a more favorable phase than my source, if you like. Okay. So 
1.2 electron volts is the price you have to pay. Now these experiments are done again at about room temperature, a little, a little higher, um, but not much, so about 240 Celsius, I think. So if you translate that temperature into an energy, you find it's worth about 0.9 electron volts. Hmm, it's close, but really not that close. And I'm gonna argue it's not close enough. So you don't have this amount of thermal energy available, okay? And what that means is that this process that I just described for you mostly never happens because you just don't ever get over this barrier or at best very rarely. So what does happen? So here's a different kind of growth mode that I want to look at. Not growth on the big flat surface, but growth on the skinny side wall of the halfway grown platelet. So now the growth has a sort of a different um, history. So because the sidewall is very, very narrow, it might just be three, four, five atomic layers high, by the time the island gets to be that width, it's spanned the entire width that needs to be, and then it only needs to grow in this one direction. It just needs to propagate across, okay? And that actually has a pretty profound effect. If you work out the, geom or the algebra for the energy as a function of the size of this island, what you find is that it has a completely different form qualitatively than the first situation we studied, in that it is now linear in the island size, whereas this is obviously not linear in the island size because that's curvature through this a to the one half right here. Okay, so if it's linear, then it's a straight line in this plot, and if it's a straight line with a negative slope, for the same reason that the material is more favorable than the starting material that has a negative slope. So that means this straight line must intersect our curve at some point. Second point is that the slope of this line depends on the thickness of this facet, M. So again, I don't want to get bogged down into the weeds of relating the picture here to the algebra here. Just ignore the algebra and look at the picture, the plot. So the slope of this line, as I've drawn it here, is appropriate for a six monolayer thick nanoplatelet. And so that means that the growth sequence for this material might be climb up this curve here until you get to 1.2 electron volts and then go down this straight path. It's still exothermic, but you're now growing something else than what you thought you were starting with. You're now growing this, um, this um, thing on the sidewall here. But 1.2 electron volts, I've already said, we don't have. So that's not gonna happen either. But now let me reevaluate this line here for a narrower facet of five monolayers and four monolayers and three monolayers. And now you see what's happening. This intersection point occurs earlier and earlier. And by the time you get to two monolayers, well now we're well within the available thermal energy, which I said was about 0.9 EV. So what you'll get is very fast growth on these very narrow facets, slower growth on the thicker facets, no growth on the wide facet. Okay, I can go all the way to one monolayer and see what happens, but now this straight line has the opposite slope, it turns out. And that's a combination of how all of these parameters uh, interact with one another. So what this tells me is that I won't get actually growth on a one monolayer material. So one monolayer uh, cadmium selenide is not a stable form, that's what this predicts. But two monolayers would be stable, the most stable in fact. Okay, so this is kind of a, an intrinsic instability in this growth pattern, unrelated to the thermodynamic um, ground state of the system, which is to make a isotropic shape. So we're very far from equilibrium. This is non-equilibrium kinetics, if you like, and it's showing us that there's an intrinsic instability to grow fast on a narrow facet. To grow faster and faster, the narrower the facet is. Okay. So that's all kind of suggestive, but maybe you'd like to see, again, a movie. So I'm going to use the same methodology that I used before, the kinetic Monte Carlo method, to do what would be normally a very burdensome calculation. So just a few words of introduction here. The orange ball you see over here is my starting nucleus. So what is it? It's not actually an atom, like I showed you in the first uh, movies half an hour ago. This is actually a monomer, so a bound pair of cadmium selenide. Cadmium and selenium bind to each other very strongly, and they mostly don't unbind in the solution. So at least that's what's believed. So I'm always going to treat them as a bound unit. And then I'm going to allow more monomers of cadmium and selenium to 
either stick or unstick from this seed nucleus here according to, again, Arrhenius type reaction rates with activation barriers taken from density functional theory, which now I'm not going to show you. But of course the key is that the lattice is cubic and all the interactions are isotropic, so they're the same in X, Y, and Z. And what you're going to see is that instability that I claimed exist now play out in the real world. Um, so, as you can see, very quickly you fall into that um, instability regime where we're forming a two-layer thick, rather broad and rather long thing that you could call plausibly a nanoplatelet. Okay? So, of course, that's just one simulation and maybe that's not enough to convince you. So we did a thousand simulations and collected some statistics about them. So we did a thousand simulations starting from, in fact, different shaped nuclei and different size nuclei because we didn't want to bias our results in any way. So some of our nuclei were the simplest possible, like the one I just showed you. Some of them are completely isotropic, like a little cube of uh, eight monomers. Some of them are, you know, less uh, symmetrical things. In the end, what we're really interested in is the ensemble uh, average behavior of the system. Okay, so here I, here's how I present my results. It's a little uh, non-conventional. So on the vertical axis is the dimension in monolayers of the thinnest d dimension. So what I just showed you was two monolayers in thickness. And on the other axis is the average of the other two dimensions, the medium-sized one and the biggest one. So the thing I just showed you was this structure here. That was turns out to be 2 by 14 by 8, give or take. And so that puts us on this side, this line here of 2, and four, the average of 14 and 8 is about 12, so it's one of these points right here. And here's a little histogram that just shows how those all break down. And so what you can see is that the majority, about 90% of all of the simulations, wind up to be two monolayers thick and, you know, sort of 10 monolayers in length and width. There are some that are three monolayers thick, and they tend to be a little bit uh, squatter, okay, so not quite as broad and a couple that are even four, and a couple that are even five. These are five by five. So these are actually symmetrical cubic nanocrystals. So a very tiny percentage of them end up like that. In the calculations and in the real world, if I lower the temperature, not even by very much, sorry, if I raise the temperature, not even by very much, then I get a huge increase in this population right here. And I get the traditional so-called quantum dots, more or less um, symmetrical nanocrystals. And these platelets go away. So this instability only exists at sufficiently low temperature. Not terribly low, and it's surprising to me that it's so similar to the temperature where you get normal quantum dots. Okay, so now we have a, a model to understand nanoplatelets through this instability, and we can apply it to other materials. So here I've applied it to the three materials that are very similar, CAD selenide, the one I just showed you, CAD sulfide, CAD telluride. Um, so the bottom line here is what they predict. So for CAD selenide, what they predict is that there should be platelets in the range of two to five monolayers. Remember, one monolayer never forms, and six never forms because you don't have enough energy, but two through five do. Two are the most favorable. CAD sulfide, it's the same. CAD telluride, it's a little bit different. You expect slightly thicker um, platelets to be stable. And so far, as far as we know, all of these predictions have been borne out by experiments, or at least consistent with experiments. We can go to a completely different material system and ask what happens. So let's take uh, mercury selenide. So that's chemically very different. And again, I just need to calculate with DFT these parameters here. That's just three numbers. And now what I find is that the whole shape of the classical nucleation, um, you know, nucleation on the wide facet is much, much lower in energy. So I always have this thermal energy available. So what this would say for mercury selenide is that you don't expect there to be any platelet instability. You would never get platelets, therefore, and that's true in experiment. Uh, you can also develop sort of very simple generic criteria for investigating new material systems. So remember I talked about those uh, straight lines that had negative slope, although for a certain value they turn upwards and have positive slope. So that's what we would call you know, stable platelet growth and unstable situation where you don't get platelet growth. And it's good to know what the critical thickness is that divides these two types of behavior. Well, you can just calculate that from the algebra of those, that energy expression. Uh, 
And it's just the ratio of the surface energy to the volume energy multiplied by the step height. And so what this tells you then is that you would like this critical value to be sm as small as possible. It doesn't make sense to have you know, platelets that are 30 monolayers thick. That's not a platelet. So you want this number to be small, like 2, 3, 4. So to make this, this small, you want to make the numerator as small as possible. The denominator you're sort of stuck with because that's a bulk material property. But you can play with the numerator by, uh, say, using strongly binding ligands that will reduce the surface energy and therefore the numerator and therefore this critical value. So that's one general approach to making new nano platelet materials. Um, we can also investigate the long time behavior. How do these platelet populations evolve? And I'm not going to go into the uh, details here other than to say what we do, did is to set up a set of first order rate equations. This is something that's traditional in chemistry uh, where you evolve a, set, a population from say the uh, initial population to, so this would be like the uh, monomer population to a platelet population where the subscript indicates the thickness of the platelets. Anyway, the bottom line is shown in the picture here. What this shows you is that first, you have only monomers in solution, but, but as you grow, these platelets develop. And they're two monolayers in thickness because those are the most stable ones. But if you wait longer, much longer, this is logarithmic time, time down here, then those go away. They start to dissolve back in solution and they are replaced by slightly thicker platelets, three monolayers. And this is why it's so easy to separate these populations experimentally. You just wait much longer and all your two monolayer platelets turn into three monolayer platelets and so on. You can get four and five and six at considerably longer time. And this is also in qualitative agreement with the experiment. Okay, so I'm done. I think I've already said enough about the first half of the um, the, the talk here. For the second half of the talk, uh, the growth of platelets of cubic cad selenide, the puzzle was why does an isotropic material, a cubic material, sometimes grow in this extremely anisotropic platelet shape? And the answer, our answer is that there's an intrinsic built-in kinetic instability, which I don't think was known about before, towards faster growth on thinner facets. At least for some material systems, it remains to be determined you know, how broad the, that group is. And that, what's, that's what we're doing right now, is using this model to predict new materials that might be likely to form platelets. So I'll be happy to take any more questions, and thanks for your time. Mm -hmm. I, I have a question about the second part of your talk. I mean, generally, I mean, experimentally, when you are growing stuff, you are actually, you are not uh, growing them perfectly, right? So you have some kind of kind of defect size, maybe vacancy defects or maybe the orientation of, of mm -hmm. the bond is reversed. I mean, did, did you consider these kind of effects in your model? Mostly not. So we do, I mean, vacancies, yes. And um, I mean, you might have seen them in the simulation as it you know, it played by very fast, but basically what you have there is random attachment. So every available site on the surface has an equal probability of a monomer adsorbing at it. And once one is adsorbed, it has a certain probability per unit time of desorbing. And so naturally with that scheme, vacancies can form. And vacancies are probably energetically, you know, a penalty because if you fill in, you get more bonds per, per, per unit. We don't consider things like misoriented bonds or, um, you know, um, twin crystals, things like that. All of those might be very interesting, um, you know, for some kind of follow-up study here. But, you know, you have to decide how complete your model is going to be versus how long are you going to take to do the research. And this is where we drew the line. So, yeah. I'm not sure if you said it, but. Uh what was the value of the temperature you used for the nano playlist? Yeah, so I, don't, I guess I didn't have that on there. Um, the temperature was, okay, so the real temperature is about 240, 250C. I mean, it varies depending. It turns out when you're doing this kinetic Monte Carlo that the system takes too long to do anything at that temperature. And so this is a common problem that's seen in the Monte Carlo world of crystal growth in general and it's been known for decades and so there are lots of solutions to it. The simplest solution is just to grow at a higher temperature and lose the relationship between the laboratory temperature and the simulation temperature. So that's what we did. So and that, that temperature was probably 700 C or so. Mm -hmm.
Yeah. So if the crystals grow in different anisotropic shapes, mm -hmm. does that also affect the first part of the talk, the, the doping, because you have different shaped crystals with different surface areas? Yeah, I've thought about that too. It would be really interesting to go back and, you know, because Right, in the first part of the talk, I think what you're alluding to is that the Coulomb interaction is very strong when it's confined. And if it's confined even further by having, you know, something instead of five nanometers high is just one nanometer high, then you might have some really spectacular effects. That's an open question. I would, if you'd like to work on it, give me a call. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, well thanks again. Yeah, thanks.